and welcome to the eighth edition of the SALT Lunchbox. My name is Dave, I'm the founder of SALT Sport and Life Training. We're a not-for-profit health education company that normally presents in clubs and workplaces on a range of topics related to well-being and mental health, leadership and culture. The aim of our Lunchbox sessions are to inspire and connect, inspire you to take at least one thing that you learn in each session and apply it into your lives. The other aim is to connect people, to connect you better to the people who you love and care for, but also to connect you to a group of people who meet regularly at this lunchbox to encourage one another. As always, we're going to have the chat and the Q&A icons open for people to participate. So we'd love you to, as always, write in who you are, where you're from, any questions you have, any suggestions or tips that you have for other people and make sure you mark it uh, as available for all panelists and attendees to read. As always, we'd like to express our deep appreciation to our sponsors, Eastland, Bendigo Bank, and FC Business Solutions. Without their generosity, we wouldn't be able to support these sessions or bring them to you free of cost. So today's topic, no sport, no friends, what now? You know, we're in unprecedented times, aren't we? And we hear about the health impact and the social impact and the financial impact and the educational impact. But today we want to focus on the sporting impact, which for some might seem less important, but maybe not to those who deeply love sport and who rely on it so much for more than just the physical outlet that it brings. And our very special guest today is another dear friend of mine, Anthony Phillips. Anthony is the founder of Camp Australia of Phillips Coaching and the Phillips Foundation. He's the current head of the Oakley Chargers under 16 football side. He's the coach of the Caulfield Grammar First 18 and he's the senior assistant coach at the Vic Metro under 16 football side. And he's one of very few level three AFL high performance coaches. Anthony and Liz, his wife, are tremendous supporters of SALT through the Phillips Foundation. And welcome to our SALT Lunchbox. Anth, are you with us? Let's bring in Anthony. Here he is. Thanks a lot, Dave. And, uh, How are you? Very well, yourself? Yes, very well. So, um, Anthony, just tell us a little bit about, you know, this, this break in routine for you. You're so invested in, in sport and in education and suddenly, like most of us, it all came to an end. So, so tell us how things have unfolded for you and, and how you've responded. Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, time. I mean, to be full on pretty hands-on, I suppose, sport, physical activity, you're always on your feet, you're always talking, engaging with people. So um, now it's online and uh, pretty much you, you keep doing the education and the connections, but it's just, um, you know, by, by webinars and uh, discussions online now and Zooms and MS team meetings. So it's still, you know, keeping that nice human connection, but just in a different uh, format. Mm. So tell us a little bit about how un things how things unfolded for you. Well, I'll, I'll pretty much uh, go into uh, how it all started. Yeah, I mean, just with what I see in you know salt too, sport and life is you know such an intertwining uh, two areas, and then we've used it all through our life, um, growing up as young children, uh, just living, breathing sport, and, and loving to get outside and be physically active and, and raise a sweat. And, uh, play with your mates and uh, learn new skills. I mean, it's just, it's just a empowering thing for confidence and your self-esteem. And uh, I think, you know, it's it's an interesting one when it's taken away all of a sudden uh, in a physical sense, uh, I suppose we see and watch sport as physical activity happening. Yeah, you, you have to, you, you really, it does hit you. And I think for the first week or so, yeah, I was quite, felt quite um, unnerved by it and a bit uh, different and, um yeah, different emotions going through until the new routines are set. And then, and then I think you settle back into what you can do and can control. And I think that's uh, really what's happened, um, you know, for definitely for us and our family, uh, having some elite sports people in the household and uh, people that are, you know, all, you know, our, our careers are all about sport and um, our businesses were run pretty much on a sporting coaching model in a lot of ways. So, yeah, it's still educating. It's just di different uh, ways of doing it, I think. Hmm. So over to you, Anth. Take us through the, the next eight to ten minutes. Yeah, no problem, Dave. So I think um, 
so I was just um, thinking back, and I just got off the putting uh, putting green. I've got set up at home there, so I set things up at home. Things you can do by yourself. Work on my short game in golf. <laughs> so that was great. But I was thinking back to um, the pilgrimage to the MCG, and, uh, and I think as a kid, but also as an adult, you look at the power of sport, and, and I, I suppose when you see all those people um, striving into the MCG and you're thinking there's players, there's officials, there's coaches, there's people with jobs there, um, there's functions on, there's a whole range of people, um, society, almost tribal-like suburbs are coming in to play against each other. Uh, it, it's just amazing. That's just in footy. Obviously, the MCG hosts and, and the, the tennis centre and that amazing precinct in Melbourne, many sports and we're probably luckiest, you know, to have the, the most amazing uh, sports mm -hmm. precinct, only five minutes sort of walk from our CBD. But that just, you know, makes me feel alive. I know for a lot of people, um, whether you like sport or not, you know, you're going to read about it, you're going to see it on TV, you're going to see people in parks doing it. So I think, um, you know, it certainly plays a massive, massive role and um, for everyone in society. Probably the biggest thing and an interesting thing that happened when we were, I was just running one of my um, pathway programs is we, we'd been through, you know, a whole lot of um, sessions, uh, probably about 30 sessions and had a number of practice games and we were quite an elite squad and they were right up to their championship games and, and playing really uh, good football in particular. And all of a sudden on the Monday, I, and I, I know Jai Bond's on the uh, line here, so I think I got the message from him at, at Oakley Chargers and it was to stop, stop all coaching, stop, stop the program. Uh, the AFL had sent that directive to that footy was to cease everywhere. And so we had kids that were just dumbfounded, just, just I think we we're all in shock. And, um, you know, when our something like our real passion and livelihood and way of, you know, our purpose and our passion in life has just sort of almost stopped in its tracks. It was quite a, an interesting uh, time there. So we had to ring all the parents and um, get them to come back in and pick up their kids and explain what's happened and that we're not sure when it'll recommence, but we'll, we'll certainly be in contact. Um, it was certainly an unprecedented, uh, very bizarre feeling. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I think the impact of having no sport, you know, it, it's... It is such a powerful thing. And I, I remember Mandela's speech, and I've used it before, the, the power of sport and how it engages and connects and unites everyone. And things like the Olympics, you think everyone, you know, most countries and most people on the planet watch people engaging in sports and, and physical activities. And I suppose when all those things are stopped, you have a look at all the big events that have been stopped, um, you know, the Formula One and the, the, the footy and the cricket and the and all the AFW, the women's footy, right at the final stage and the prelim finals. It's just, there must be major disappointments for people like that. Also, a lot of kids that um, we're training that are, you know, going into drafts and things like that to be professional sports people. I mean, it's their final year, some. So I really have a real deep feeling um, of, um, well, main, mainly hope, hope for them, um, hope that they things will return to normal and they'll get that opportunity to really um, strive for their dreams, which sport, you know, can give you. I mean, there are those aspects of physical, I mean, your conditioning, I mean, just getting fit and healthy and running around and doing your circuits and things like that. I think, um, you know, keep your body in shape and keep your mind pretty sharp. So obviously there's an impact there. You've got to reconnect um, with some sort of home training, uh, which I think most people have done with yogas and, um, you know, strength classes and all sorts of qigong and meditation and, and great things online that you can do and you can book in schedules, which is great. The mental side of it, I think that's the hardest thing to, to just try and keep focused. Um, I know with our elite guys, um, especially a couple living at home, like to relax and take a break and, and do some, um, yeah, real quiet things and some different things, out, outdoor activities, playing tennis, um, you know, meditating, going for a ride, um, going, you know, for a surf, whatever it might be that the rules allow, of course. Um, and also having study and other interests. I think other working interests are really important and to follow your um, careers beyond your sporting uh, routine. So that's um, a really important part. Um, obviously, people and, and general supporters, you know, they're getting the replays of the footy matches instead of the live matches and things like that. But I know a lot of people are getting a lot of joy out of that. So whatever it may be um, that you can use to keep your mind um, 
nice and clear and still positive. Um, obviously, emotionally, you go through ups and downs. As I said, I think at the start, you know, until this new routine's um, set in and now, now a good month or so, you know, it's just, just keeping calm and, and, and knowing time will pass and heal and keeping really balanced in what you eat and what you do and, and your connections with people as a human, um, socially, I think through your, those party meetings and dress ups and fun activities that you can do and dinner parties that you can have with your friends, um, checking with family, uh, different uh, birthday celebrations. I think they've been really good. And I think looking at the, the great positive human nature of hope, you know, looking to um, this, you know, new time and, and the new things we'll learn and take into the future is, you know, what's really, I think, empowering for everyone. I, I look uh, very positively on it as just a chapter in life and um, we'll use it and, and move on to bigger and better things. But socially, sticking together is crucial. Staying in touch, um, using this is where the social platforms and I've learned more more than that about that um, in the last few weeks from my usually my youngest um, daughter Lucy. She's fantastic, but the kids too um, have shown some good safe ways to use social media in a good positive way. Um, and you know, it can be quite inventive, I think, and creative as well with some of the great um, YouTube videos and the fun activities that connect people. Um, people are putting up. Community also, I suppose that's the biggest one. When you go to your, your sporting clubs or you go to your recreational gyms or, you, you know, you, people like to be a part of something. I think that's the biggest thing. So to keep checking in, um, be involved and interested in others, um, just get out of your own space. We can all go into our own space a lot in these times. But I think it's really important to um, make sure, you know, you connect with people and lots of different groups that you come across through your life make sure it's been a good time to check back in with we, we checked in with college people from 35 years ago mm. 20 or 30 come in and um we had a great time we, we couldn't get some of them off offline for about an hour hour and a half so that was great so you've got to support um one another but really lead the way i think um everyone can you know my theory around leadership is that everyone can be a leader and you can be your best leader by you know, uh, watching good role models and learning and, and reading good books on it, but also practicing leadership. So I, I think it's a great time now to, to do that. The um, connection with um, players, I know, I know from um, in terms of clubs, you know, staying in contact with players, schools staying in contact with each other, um, sporting pathway programs. I think it's been a really big thing of communication and keeping people committed to, to what were plans and it may have been stopped, but they've been pushed out a little bit, I suppose, postponed. And we don't know when that start date might be, which is the trickiest thing I've found for young people. You know, when do we go back? Is it a month, two months, three months, not for the rest of the year? So I think that's been one of the hard things to train for. And I'll talk a bit about periodizing your training, which um, most phys editors and, and fitness people know about. But I think that's the, that's the real challenge, how you actually, you know, uh, raise your intensities at the right time to prepare yourself to come back to playing, especially if you're playing in competition, which might, a lot of sport is. Um, so I, th I think um, some initiatives we've had is form mentor groups. We've had mentor groups with coaches and, and different um, significant people that um, young people can um, ring and contact and, and ask for advice and we can guide them with books and videos and information. So that's been a really terrific thing. And I think, yeah, we just need to be as coaches and adults, be mindful um, of all those protocol and sticking to your, you know, the right sort of language and making sure we're task focused when we're talking to um, children in particular um, about sports and activities and improvement plans and self um, development plans that they can do at home and work with maybe one partner as the rules um, suggest. And uh, I think also then to encourage the social interaction to make sure that um, club websites are up to date. They've got some online content. We've helped out our junior club, Beverly Hills um, with the footy. Uh, I've had soccer guys, netball, athletics, tennis, just tapping into different coaches to provide online skills, basic things you can do by yourself with a ball, with a bat and a ball, with a wall, with a you know two by two square meter space um, in strength and conditioning activities and even running and, and building intensity and uh, more like a game. So there's some fantastic things out there and um, they're the sort of things that we've been using um, for our connected uh, clubs that we work with. 
the whole group Zooms are great. So probably a couple of things from a group that I coach quite a, uh, a school group that are a pretty, um, pretty talented group of um, footballers. There are two things when we ask them what they needed in these times. One was connection and one was game intensity. So that connection to ability to get everyone on doing a, an exercise routine or a skill session, even if it's for 10 or 20 minutes, I think would be a great benefit if you can set that up a bit like Dave and Salt we're doing here. And also game intensity. I mean, it's hard in those ones, you know, where you haven't got opponents and you haven't got pressure and you haven't got physical contact of opposition. How, how do you replicate game pressure? I suppose that's that's the one where you know using high intensity circuits that um, you know can replicate a little bit of that physicality and change of you know up and running uh, fast and hard and down and push ups and doing burpees and you know jumping side to side all those things that might happen in your sport whatever that sport might be so mm -hmm. I think um, that's given us the ability to use some initiative the coaches and some of the trainers and they've come up with some fantastic. Uh, programs that we, I know we're going to implement in some of our uh, our uh, groups and squads in the next uh, month or two. Fantastic. And There's thanks. also um, a big thing on engagement. May have used. Whoops. Sorry, Dave. No, that's okay. I was just going to bring in Edwina because uh, we're, we're halfway through our time. So uh, come in and join us, Edwina. Welcome again. And Edwina, just briefly, because you'll say it better than I, you were the founder of Sporting Pulse. Just tell us really briefly uh, about that and also your role um, with the, uh, the Commonwealth Games and the Oceania Committee. Um, okay, Sporting Pulse for, or Fox Sports Pulse. It's had very various um, changes over the years. Uh, there are about half a dozen of us that um, started that back in 2000. And it was to bring... Um, online sports results uh, mm -hmm. out to grassroots sport and working with the AFL, working with rugby league, predominantly um, two big sports and the Eastern footy league were a very big partner of ours in getting that solution right. But certainly it's now the norm that we can get our own fixtures results and ladders online. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And through that work at Sporting Pulse was able to work with the Oceania National Olympic Committee in creating an online environment for the Oceania countries. So um, out in the Pacific, the countries are quite remote um, and we created a platform called Oceania Sport, which was a digital platform for bringing that community closer together. But um, since leaving Sporting Pulse, I'm back in education, still on the executive of the sports federations. So now as we are contemplating all of the major competitions being cancelled. It's working out how to support our athletes mm. who are now in their home country. Some have been in colleges in the US, so they've had to come home and now working how to support them. And I think it's, you know, as Anthony was saying, that social connection is so important. So making sure that we don't just leave them to their own devices, that we're providing that support. And as families, we're just having a go to get alongside them. Um, I think mums and dads will be trying to become more expert in sports, but just getting out and kicking the footy uh, at whatever that looks like, I think is really important in getting alongside our, our young people and, and showing that we really care about what they're going through. Okay, I'm just having a look at some of the comments coming through and we've got some uh, people joining us today, I think for the first time. We've had Les Twentyman before, but fantastic. Most people have heard of, of Les and we know that he writes articles in the media, but he's working um, with 600 kids in his basketball um, club and, uh, and Les, terrific to have you. We might get you on at some stage. I reckon you'd be fantastic to have. Back to you just briefly, Ed, you and I were talking earlier about... Um, some of the changes that have happened over the past decade or so, particularly at elite sport and how clubs have become far more mindful of their wider role so that it's you know, not any longer simply about coaching kids or, or young people to be better at their sport, but it's much wider than that. Tell us about the importance of sport and, uh, and, and how clubs have changed and need to change moving forwards. Yeah, I think, um, I guess my background is also psychology, uh, psychology teaching and that real passion that um, when we feel connected to our club and that we're part of a team that is beyond just my own personal performance, so that that social cohesion is what brings 
greater success, both individually and collectively. And I think elite teams are finding that it is now about the selection of character above skill. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, this is one of the things that we can really work on at this time. There's a huge challenge at the moment where there's so much disappointment for young people as they're missing out on opportunities, whether that's, and I've looked at some of the comments, whether they're the final year of school where they're missing out on representing their school or someone's been selected for the hockey ruse for the first time to go to the Olympics and now they can't go, will they then be still in the team in 12 months time? All of these perhaps disappointments, we can't control that, but we can control how we respond to that. So what can we do, not what we're missing out on, but what can we do in this situation? And I think this is where families can, um, you know, if we want our kids to, to get up and, and be active, then we have to get alongside them. But club, um, coming back to your point, Dave, around the elite clubs, Richmond Football Club um, is the club I support. And to see their transformation over the last five years perhaps or the more recent probably the last three years wasn't about more skill development it was about creating this social cohesion and even though we're physically isolated we can still do that with our teams and i think it's critical um, when we have when our emotional well-being is about our connection to clubs and we don't have that and we are physically separated that we focus on these things. And I think we can be creative around how we do that. We need to continue to do it. And it's such, you know, we know that when we are physical, when we are connected, we're gonna perform better. And whether that's in school or in sport, um, that's the case. And I think we've got a great opportunity at the moment to create some um, greater social cohesion as we get online and talk about what our challenges are and being prepared to be vulnerable with mm. one another. So let's just list some things, Anthony and, and Edwina. We've, um, I've been watching some clubs doing really innovative things, like um, somebody kicks the toilet paper roll up three times and then kicks it into the next room, but it appears like it's going into the room of the next person who responds. And I, I think there's been a, a lot of creativity and, and fun. I, I know now that People are delighting in my um, sharing of my favourite albums of my life. And um, I've got no end of flack about putting up The Seekers as my number one uh, <laughs> love of music. Uh, but there's all these creative things going on. Tell us some of the best things you've seen, Anth, um, that the clubs have done really creatively to keep their players involved. Oh, I, I think, yeah, one of the first ones I saw was some, the girls at the Chargers... Uh, footy club and they, I think they had the toilet roll. That, that was the one day that I was kicking it and handballing it and marking it and passing it. And then the boys did one with the football and until one boy flew through a window and took a specky on a bed. And I thought, geez, that was, that was a bit risky, but he got there. And, uh, but geez, they were fun and that, that connected everyone as they're doing their skills, uh, you know, isolated, but it sort of connected. Like it was, that, that to me was a real innovative part of using social media for young people. I, I just thought it, it was a ripper. That, that's one of the best ones I've seen. Um, telling jokes. Who, who can tell the, the, the silliest joke? Uh, there, there's sites where you can play online games against each other. Uh, I'm seeing lots of people putting up uh, push-up competitions. Who, who can do the, the most push-ups? Ed, what else have you seen? Oh, look, I just think, um, I think running virtual trivia competitions where everyone does a round and you know you get your certain topic um and we did a family one the other night but i've heard of lots of different social groups doing this in this uh, communal participation and i think this is where footy clubs or you know any sort of sporting clubs netball clubs whatever they are have to um take the lead in some of this it may be that an individual player can't do this on their own but as clubs we can be facilitators so it's a bit like schools being facilitators of learning clubs need to be facilitators and even if they may be a little apprehensive about getting on with technology I think they can do that and see that they have a really really important role to bring their young people together because mm. that is what they need um, this, that's what parents need uh, to have to make sure that their young people are 
connecting with their teammates so they don't lose that. And I think teams and clubs need to, to take that responsibility, Dave, and think mm. around these creative things to do. One of, the best, one of the best ones we had, Dave, was just putting through, you know, uh, videos, we call them super skill challenges. It might be juggling or as many kicks as you can do, uh, many goals you can shoot in a row, that sort of thing. So clubs can then make a bit of a challenge list and see who can beat the records. So it gets it, you know, you know, trying to achieve something each day and keep working on a skill and technique. Um, so that was another another good one. And also, if you're running a strength conditioning, so you, that athletic performance side of your sport, um, to actually have accountability, like have a score sheet and a card so you can see if I do this work, I, I am feeling fitter and stronger and I can progress each day. Mm. So there are two other good things I've seen in some of the clubs we're working with as well that, you know, it keeps kids focused on schedule, gives them something to do each day. In regards to that, um, and as Edwina said, it's got some fun and social, but it's also got some of those bases of sport, that progression and trying to improve yourself and develop fitness and strength. And mm. skill. Look, we're getting towards the end. I reckon there's something that um, I'd like to mention. We used to talk to clubs about these things called TAG groups, and TAG stood for Time, Accountability and Guidance. And we would ask that the leadership groups or whoever was nominated within the clubs would have a list of players that they would regularly check in with. Now, my fear is that a lot of players might be doing these things, but there could be players falling through the gaps. And so I would say that as a club, if you know your, your complete list, including you know, your, your volunteers and the whole community, and you make sure that every person is in a list that gets contacted, and it might be once a week, it could be through... Um, a text message or, or through an, another means, but that every person gets checked in on at some stage to make sure that they're okay. Uh, because there will be people who are doing it well, but there'll be others who aren't, and we won't know unless we inquire of them. I'm going to just um, throw there's some slides to, to finish up, and um, here we go. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks, Edwina. Three takeaway points from today from Anthony. Number one, that we have to connect. Communicate, regular interaction, involve everybody. That's that point I was making. Oh, sorry, slides aren't up. How's that? Can we see that now? Connect, communicate, regular interaction, involve everybody. Engage, set schedules, routines for self together, your buddy, your mentor groups. Uh, so make sure that everybody's getting involved. And finally, empower that whole notion that during this time, we can grow in ways that we wouldn't other. We can get better at game strategy. We can get better at... Um, a range of sports that we wouldn't normally play. Uh, we can take aspects from other sports and incorporate them into our own sports. So they're the three major takeaways from today that we'll be putting up on the website and the Facebook, um, as well as that um, at SALT, we're already putting quite a lot of work and it's in the final testing phase. But if you're a club administrator or you're involved in a club and you would like us to work with your club in regards to what can you be doing to more actively involve your community or how can you better position yourself when players start to come back? That's going to be a new frontier for everybody. What do the clubs look like when we come back and how can we prepare for that? Then contact Carissa. You can see her details there because there's some terrific work being done in the background by Dave and Carissa as to how we can get clubs working in this Club Connect space more strongly. Next week or on Wednesday, actually, we're going to be talking about our values. What drives you? What is it that the inner voice that um, you learnt when you were very young about what matters most to you? And sometimes that can be used in our favour. Sometimes we need to look at that and go, gosh, is that really who I want to be? So that's going to be a wonderful session on Wednesday. We'd love you to join us. We want to thank Anthony and the Phillips Foundation, Liz, um, are wonderful supporters of us. Also, Bendigo Bank, Eastland and FC Business Solutions. Uh, a lot of people can't listen at one o'clock. We understand that. So if you've missed sessions in the past or you want to catch up on sessions, then go to our website. There's now a very clear link from the website to the YouTube channel that has all the sessions that we've done or if you missed one, you can catch them up at other times. That's the lifeline number, which we always put up in case you are struggling. We know that People need that 24-7 um, resource that uh, if you are really down and desperate. 
And so thank you. It's now 1.30. Thanks, Anth. Thanks, Edwina. Thanks to everybody. Sorry we didn't get to many of the comments today. I know that Lane was answering them as we went along. We had some new people today, which we're just so grateful. Um, and we continue to listen to your feedback as to what you'd like to have in the future. Please join us on Wednesday for the session on values. And remember, we do come out of this time stronger, better, richer in the things that really matter. Thanks, everybody.